This is the Moz 7, a new 7-inch quadcopter from Gep RC. And today, we're going to take a close look at it and see how it stacks up to the iFlight Chimera 7 that I reviewed previously. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something. <laughs> I guess I crash tested it. <laughs> oh. It's a little bit weird to be reviewing a 7-inch quadcopter in 2023. The videos I've released recently about micro quadcopters have done way better than I thought they would. Not that I didn't think they'd do well, but like one of them is on track to be one of my best performing videos I've ever released. And I think that reflects the environment that we're living in where uh, remote ID is sort of on the horizon and everybody's wondering what it all means and flying smaller, quieter, less obtrusive quadcopters, especially under 250 grams, starts to look a lot more appealing. But there is a place for these big quadcopters. And I recently found myself struggling with the limitations of a five inch quadcopter when Ken Heron invited me out to fly with actual full scale airplanes. He said, we're gonna coordinate with the pilot and you can fly along with the plane as it takes off and lands. And the pilot said, do you wanna go fly a full pattern with me? I'll be at 2000 feet. And I said, <laughs> not today FAA. But I did fly alongside that airplane and I could barely keep up because the takeoff speed of that airplane was something like 60 or 70 miles per hour. And at first I thought, this is no problem. My five inch can go 60 or 70 miles an hour and it can, but boy, it is really close to the top of its throttle range. And I just wasn't able to get the footage that I really would have liked to get sort of tucking in close behind the airplane. And, 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 and I just couldn't do that because I was just too, I didn't have the power and I didn't have the endurance to really do it. And I found myself wishing I had brought a seven inch. So seven inch quadcopters have their place for things like vehicle chasing, for things like longer endurance flights when you need to go 20 minutes while carrying a GoPro instead of just three to five minutes, or for longer range flying, things like mountain cruising, where it's gonna take you a little while to get up to the top of that mountain before you cruise on back down again. And you need the endurance of a platform like this. But you're probably already thinking about whether you should get a quadcopter like this if you're watching this video. So let's take a closer look at how the GEPRC Moz 7 stacks up to what I think is one of the best 7-inch bind and flies you can get today, the iFlight Chimera 7. And I actually have to start this video by putting the Moz 7 back together because the Moz 7, like many modern, especially larger quadcopters, comes with side plates and protective panels and I actually had to remove these protective panels to bind and flash the O3 air unit. So you can see right here that the O3 air unit USB and SD card are accessible from this side and the bind button is accessible from the other side, but you actually have to take off these side panels, which involves removing a screw. I'm, I'm really annoyed. I, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm annoyed at this trend. It does make the quadcopters like look more sort of professional, and less sort of hobby janky, but it just makes maintaining them and working with them that much harder. And I'm not sure it actually has any benefit. The quadcopter we're reviewing today has the DJI O3 air unit in it. And that's pretty cool because the O3 air unit can record up to 4K 120 FPS on board without having any extra GoPro. Uh, if you are just 
trying to get footage for yourself and you're not trying to do something professionally, a lot of people are going to choose to leave the GoPro at home, save themselves the extra three to five hundred dollars that they're putting at risk when they put the quadcopter in the air and just capture footage with the O3. It doesn't look as good as a GoPro, but it looks good enough especially if you're not doing anything professional. But a problem that many frame designers ran into when the O3 first came out is that if the O3 camera is not soft mounted, then the image stabilization that the camera is capable of doesn't work. Now, if you don't intend to use image stabilization, this doesn't matter to you. But if you do, and many people flying a seven inch are gonna be doing the kind of cinematic cruising where stabilization is desirable. If you're gonna use stabilization, then you definitely need a frame that is gonna soft mount that camera. And the Moz 7 has that. It takes the approach that many frame designers are taking today, which is to have TPU printed inserts. And we'll see how well that works when we put this up for a flight test. It's worth saying that some people feel that even TPU doesn't provide as much vibration isolation as you would like, and they prefer silicone inserts. Gepercy has obviously decided that TPU is good enough. The front end of the Moz 7 has been designed to fit the O3 camera. And the goal whenever you're mounting an FPV camera is to have the camera far enough forward that you don't see any of the side plates in the camera view, but to have the camera pushed far enough back that the camera is relatively well protected in a frontal impact. I'm not sure. It almost feels like this camera could be pushed just a smidge further back, although the O3 does have a pretty wide field of view, so maybe I'm wrong about that. We can see that the camera does stick out very slightly, especially these little protective ridges here. Nothing can pr completely protect the camera against an impact. There are certain ways that it could hit something that it would break that lens, but the Gepar CMOS 7 is doing about as good a job of protecting the camera as we could ask. I do wanna say that if you're gonna fly the O3 air unit, you really need to get a protective lens for the front of the camera, especially because the O3 air unit lens, just anecdotally speaking, seems to scratch easier than you would expect from what you've seen with other camera lenses. GEPRC sells an ND filter set, which works with the O3 air unit, but my personal preference is for the camera butter uh, set. Uh, the camera butter ones, I think, stick a little more securely to the camera. Frankly, they're a little hard to remove sometimes, and the camera butter guys say, that's intentional. We don't want to fall off while you fly. The GetBRC one's okay, but Camera Butter has always been my go-to. And uh, I'll have links to both of them down in the video description below if you want to pick them up. This heat sink here addresses another issue with the DJI O3 air unit, which is that it overheats really quickly if it doesn't have airflow. Uh, so if you were to plug the quadcopter in and set it down for a few minutes, say while you were waiting to get a GPS lock, in that time, the O3 could overheat, shut down, and then you have to power cycle the whole quadcopter to get it to come back to life. This problem is especially pronounced when we put side plates on the quadcopter so the O3 can't get any airflow. So manufacturers like GEPRC and iFlight have come up with a heatsink type thing here. The O3 is mounted on top inside the quad. We'll open it up, we'll take a look, you can see for yourself, and air can flow through here. If you do decide to use this on the bench, it makes sense to have a fan blowing through here to help keep the O3 air unit cool. Now we're looking at the bind and fly version of this quadcopter, so the mounting capabilities of the frame may not be that interesting to you. You're just gonna take whatever GEPRC gives you and be happy to fly it. But if you were to build this frame out yourself, it is really nice to see that GEPRC has 30 millimeter, 25 millimeter, and 20 millimeter mounting holes for both the rear and the front location. In addition, is this a separate 20 millimeter mount here? Oh my goodness, you could do three, one, two, three 20 millimeter mounts. It's a very, very versatile frame. And even if you're thinking about building your own seven inch, it might be worth your consideration. Here in the rear of the frame, we've got a hard mounted XT60 connector. And those are really nice because it helps keep your XT60 wire, your battery lead out of the props. Uh, and it makes it easier to plug and unplug the quadcopter with one hand. You don't have to hold the wire and the battery together. You just stick it in there. Unlike the iFlight version, the GEPRC version is 3D printed. It's 3D printed out of TPU, which is a nice, got a little bit of give to it, but also is really durable. And it is, in my opinion, the best filament almost always for use on multi-rotors. The same is true for the antenna mounting. We have dual antenna mounting for these 
external O3 antennas and the GPS mount as well is, it's got a little bit of give here in case of a crash, but it is rigid. It doesn't have a flexible joint, so it's always gonna come back to the same angle and it holds the GPS unit pretty securely. I'm also happy to see here on the bottom how they have closed it off. It's, it looks really secure. Like it's real, like if I try and take it out, it's relatively hard to get it out. And I'm fairly confident that GPS is gonna hold on in a crash. I love this wire routing on the GPS holder as well. And you can see that they haven't just left that wire loose, but they've got this little channel where the wire is sandwiched here in the middle to hold it in place. That's really thoughtful. We gotta have a little criticism here for the antennas that GEPRC ships the Moz 7 with. And GEPRC is hardly unique in this respect. A lot of manufacturers do this. You see, the V2 DJI system and the Cadix Vista, remember that, the, the, basically everything but the O3, that generation of video transmitters and goggles use left-hand polarized antennas. So you have left-hand polarized antennas on the goggles, left-hand polarized antennas on the quad, the polarization matches and you get the best possible signal reception. When we switch to the goggles 2 instead of the V2 goggles, these have linear antennas on the goggle. And what that means is when you combine linear antennas on the goggle with circular antennas on the quad, you get a difference in range of about 1.4 times. In other words, if this quad had linear antennas like the O3 stock antenna is, it would get about 1.4 times the range compared to its current configuration where there's circular antennas on the quad. Now, that's all lab stuff. That's all bench stuff. The actual difference in range isn't necessarily gonna be exactly 1.4 times. It may be more, it may be less. For example, these antennas stick up higher than the stock antenna would. That's gonna give you an increase in range. And maybe that makes up for some of the difference. But there's no doubt in my mind that you would get more and better range and penetration if we had linear antennas on the quad. So why don't we? Well, I suspect that a lot of people in the industry don't even realize that the Goggles 2 has linear antennas. They just assume it's the same as the V2 goggles and go with left-hand polarized antennas. And some of it might be that there just aren't very many aftermarket linear antennas. The only one I know of right now is made by Flyfish RC of all people. And so they may have just decided that the desire to have these antennas stick up further and thereby increase their range compared to the stock antenna was worth it. Also, if you are using the V2 goggles with the O3, which you totally can, then you may have left-hand polarized antennas on your goggles in which case this is a perfect match. One thing you might think about doing if you fly the G2 though, is to buy aftermarket linear antennas and try them on this quad instead of the stock left-hand antennas that it comes with, you may get better range. I'll put a link down in the video description below to the Flyfish RC antennas. I actually have some that I, ooh, they sent me some to test. I'm not gonna do that in this video, but maybe I'll do it in a future video and uh, see if they get better performance. Let's lift the top plate off and see what we got going on inside this quadcopter. Starting at the front of the quadcopter, we've got a buzzer. It's nice to have a dedicated buzzer so you don't have to use your motors to beep. It'll usually be louder than the motor beeper. And it's in a nice 3D printed holder that also holds the receiver. The receiver in this case is Express LRS. Uh, you can buy that with other different control links if you prefer, but obviously Express LRS is becoming very, very popular for long range. It is interesting to me the way they've mounted the antenna. So the antenna is mounted here in the front and it's a little bit inside the carbon fiber frame, which is potentially gonna reduce its range somewhat. A lot of other builds would hang the antenna out the back and put it near the GPS unit and having it out the back away from the carbon might help, but it would also place it closer to the video transmitter antennas and also potentially mess with the GPS. So what GEPRC has done here may not be the best for the control link range, but may be the best solution for sort of all round performance of all of the systems. Continuing toward the back of the quadcopter, we come to the flight controller and the ESC. I'm not gonna take all the nuts off to lift the flight controller up and show you the ESC. Oh, you can take my word for it. It is a BLH32 ESC and it's rated for 50 amps. Now that 50 amp rating might sound a little bit low because we run racing drones with 50 or 60 amp ESC. So shouldn't a big seven inch have a higher rated ESC? And actually that logic is kind of backwards. This seven inch is gonna be more efficient and pull less current than a little racing drone that's going like balls to the wall. So 50 amps should be plenty if we assume that the ESC is like reasonably 
made, designed and constructed. The flight controller is a 30 millimeter flight controller and so is the ESC, which is nice because I think 30 millimeter electronics tends to be more durable than 20 millimeter. I would really hesitate to put a 20 millimeter flight controller and ESC on a seven inch, although some do, and it seems to work for them. Uh, this flight controller is specifically designed to go in this frame. So for example, you can see right here, they've got the bootloader button facing sideways next to the USB port. So it's accessible from the side when you pull the cover off. The flight controller also has built-in Bluetooth. So if you have the SpeedyB app for your phone, you can actually plug in power and access the flight controller, configure it and so forth, just like with Betaflight without ever plugging in USB. And that's really nice for field configuration. Continuing on, we've got a capacitor here to help soak up those electrical spikes from our great big honkin' motors. And it is nice and securely mounted in a 3D print as well as can't even tell exactly how it's mounted, but it ain't going nowhere. It's always nice to see a bigger capacitor rather than smaller because it just provides a little bit of extra protection. It does seem like there's a little room in here where they might have fit it, but maybe I'm nitpicking. And then we come to the DJI O3 air unit. The O3 air unit is hard mounted here with screws to that heat sink. Uh, so it's not going anywhere and it's reasonably well protected by these side plates. And then we've got these uh, pigtail connectors that go out to the SMA connectors here for the antennas. The motors on the Moz 7 are enormous. They are 2809 in size. That's 28 millimeters in diameter and nine millimeters in height. And a 28 millimeter motor is not that big a deal. For a seven inch prop, a 27 or 28 millimeter, even as much as a 30 millimeter motor is pretty typical. Bear in mind that the props we're actually using with this quadcopter are not seven inches, but seven and a half inches. So they're a little bit bigger even than the sort of nominal seven inch size. But that nine millimeter height, whew, like the sort of canonical seven inch motor is the Brother Hobby 2806. This is three millimeters more in height than that. And, oh, it's the same, 28. It's three millimeters more in height than that. As I put the top plate back on, I wanna call your attention to this very smart thing GEPRC have done with their GoPro mount. One of the problems with TPU GoPro mounts is that the screw squishes the TPU and sometimes the screw just rips straight through the TPU. When you've got screws holding a TPU GoPro mount on, you're sort of making a compromise. And there are various ways to solve this, but the way that GEPRC have solved it is to have a carbon fiber plate that fits into a recess at the top of the GoPro mount so that when you tighten these screws down, it's almost like a washer, but a great big washer that goes around the entire freaking mount so that these screws are pressing this plate down and just, it's really a fantastic solution. It's a fantastic solution to this problem. We're gonna take it outside and we're gonna fly. But before we do that, can I take one moment to remind you that Patreon is the single best way to support the work that I do here. If you enjoy my content, if you find it educational, if it helps you make better buying decisions, if for any reason you feel like making sure I can keep doing the work I'm doing here, there's a link in the video description below to Patreon. For as little as $2 a month or more, if you feel like I've earned it, pick an amount that is proportional to the value you get from my content and head on down there and subscribe. If today's not the day that you feel like doing that, that's cool. I'm gonna keep making this content. Hopefully you'll keep watching it and hopefully that day will come. Wow, that was fast. I have 11 satellites already, that's extraordinary. That was minutes. I know it didn't look like minutes to you. It was a few minutes at most, like two minutes at most. Impressive, very impressive. First of all, I want you to see the footage from the air units onboard recording. Uh, and the advantage of this is gonna be that it is perfect 4K video straight off the air units camera, as opposed to 1080p video as I'm seeing in my goggles. There's gonna be no reduction in image quality as I fly away from myself. Uh, the other thing is that there's gonna be image stabilization on it. Uh, the air unit can record stabilized image to its onboard recording. And if there is any problem with vibration or soft mounting of the camera, we will see that as we go flying. Finally, there is a GoPro on this quad and it's gonna let you do some comparison of the image quality of a GoPro versus a built-in camera. 
Both the GoPro and the Air Unit's camera have an ND16 filter on them. And I gotta tell you, flying with an ND filter on the damn camera is pretty disorienting because it's creating some motion blur that looks nice when you are watching the footage, but when you are flying the footage, it is disorienting, disorientating as hell. This is one reason why some people argue that the FPV camera and the high definition camera should not be the same camera because you can set the high definition camera, the GoPro up to record the best image and you can set the FPV camera up to show the pilot the best image and that those two things aren't always the same thing. But that's what we're gonna do here. How's the quadcopter fly? Pretty good for a seven inch. Um, we have a 3,500 milliamp hour 6S on here, which is a chonky boy. And we have a GoPro Hero 10, which is a chonky boy. So we're not getting as much uh, punch out and speed as we would get on a five inch, but pretty good considering the weight that we're slinging around. And our flight time, I can't complain about. We're at 3.7 volts, but we're just kind of holding there. I think we're just gonna kind of stay there till the end of the pack. Oh, this motion blur is killing me. Ooh, it's hard. Oh, the exposure algorithm on the O3 is doing okay. We'd be doing better if we were in flat color. Let's try flat color real quick. You, you don't have an old moldy trash couch in your front yard? What's wrong with you? Does anybody have one of those? Okay, now this is really what I prefer. It looks worse. Oh my God, 24 satellites, what the hell? Hold up, 25 satellites, Jesus. Wow, okay. This is a damn good GPS unit. I take, I take back any concerns I might've had. Um, this is flat color and this is what I usually like to use. It looks worse in your goggles, but you can color grade the hell out of it if you know what you're doing. And I don't know what I'm doing, but my editor does and he can make a lot out of this. So right now, now that we're in flat, we can get a lot more detail out of these shadows. We can just lift those shadows. That's this kind of tweaks we just can't do if we record in normal color. So I'm gonna stick to flat color from here on out. Gotta say, this thing flies really good for a seven inch. I know that seven inches aren't like made for freestyle, but I love to freestyle anything I can get my hands on. The tune is excellent. Look at these drops here. Like really no instability going into these drops. Very little prop wash oscillation. These big dives. If I chop throttle, watch what happens. Chop throttle here, it's completely stable. If you were to turn the volume down there, I wonder if you could even tell when I chopped the throttle. Very stable when I chopped the throttle there. And it's flying good for freestyle. Let's do a sort of, uh, throttle ramp and see if we get any vibration issues. What I like to do here is focus out on the horizon and then just ramp the throttle slowly and see if at any point in here we get any weird vibrations or any nonsense like that. I, don't, I won't know that until I get back into the studio and check the footage. It looks pretty good in the FPV goggles though. So there are two advantages that a seven inch brings to the table. And one is the ability to sort of cruise for a good long time. Um, with a lithium ion six cell, which I haven't purchased, but I don't, it hasn't come in the mail yet because it's Labor Day. With a lithium ion six cell, they advertise 30 minutes of flight time without a GoPro and 20 minutes of flight time with a GoPro. This is a 3,500 milliamp hour lithium polymer, which is gonna give us a lot more punch.
Uh, so we shouldn't expect to get that like 20 minutes of flight time, but we should expect to get quite a lot of flight time. And we can really just cruise like this for a good long while. How many amps are we pulling? Zero. The amp readout is not working. Isn't that special? Um, the other thing we can do with the seven inch that we can't do with a five inch is we can push it and hold higher speed longer with less battery sag simply because we're carrying a bigger battery. So check this out. Holding 100, oh, we got a wind, 140 kilometers an hour. Holding, still going, 140 kilometers an hour. Battery at 3.5, still holding, 130 kilometers an hour, 3.5, we're fine. 130 kilometers an hour. Have I made my point? I mean, we just held 130 kilometers an hour for maybe, uh, felt like maybe a minute. Things always feel longer when you're, uh, when you're doing them. And we're still fine. Look, 3.7 volts on the battery. We could have gone longer. You're not gonna get extra long flight time if you're at full throttle like that, but you can. So you have the choice to kind of go out there find a vehicle or something that you want to chase and then get on that throttle and really get at it and not just have your battery sag out and die like it would with a five inch but really look see now I'm at 120 miles an hour and I'm barely at I'm at 80 percent 60 percent throttle we could do that a lot longer so we're just going to get a lot more speed and a lot more duration out of this that up. Impressive, really impressive. Now we come to the hardest part of this video, which is where I have to take the iFlight Chimera 7 Pro and the GetRC Mod 7, put them side by side, and try to figure out which one is better. And this is going to be really hard because they are really closely matched. I think the body style of the Moz 7 is one of the things that really differentiates them. We can see that it is a lot sort of thicker and chunkier than the more svelte body style of the Chimera 7 Pro. And uh, there's two effects that that has. Number one, it means that the uh, Moz 7 is a little bit more amenable to customization. I just noticed that the Moz 7 has 20 millimeter mounting holes on the top plate. What is that for? Why would you ever want to mount a 20 millimeter video transmitter? What is it? I don't know. But whatever it is that you want to mount on that top plate, GEPRC have made it available to you. And just the width of the interior of the Moz 7. Like, I'm not going to open up the Camara 7 Pro again I, because it's, it's a lot of screws and I just don't feel like doing it right now. But it is really thin on the inside. And you can see it's too thin even for the flight controller and the ESC. And iFlight have got these bump outs in the side plates to make room for the flight controller and the ESC. And then it gets super narrow back through here. And it's just narrow enough for the O3. And everything is really crammed in there. If you want to fly the Chimera 7 Pro exactly as iFlight delivered it to you, great, you're good to go. But if you want to modify or extend it in any way, you're gonna struggle with that. It's not gonna be well suited to that. And frankly, if you end up in a situation where you have to do any kind of repairs, every time I have to open one of these up, the iFlight, like their Chimeras, even their five inches, they're so sort of packed in there, it makes them really compact, but it also makes them kind of hard to maintain. Whereas the GEPRC Moz 7 is just a lot roomier and a lot easier to work with, although not quite as like svelte. The other difference in the body style is in the durability. Whereas the GEPRC uses three millimeter plates, bottom and top, 
The iFlight uses 3mm plates on bottom, but only a 2mm plate on top. And there certainly is an argument to be made that the bottom plate is where most of the impact happens in a crash and where most of the durability decisions are made and broken. But there's no doubt that having that 3mm plate on top is going to increase the rigidity and increase the durability of the Gepersi at a small penalty in terms of weight. But that weight penalty may not be as much as it seems like it would be. The iFlight has a split deck design where this plate goes to the rear of the quad and this plate goes to the front. And that split deck design means that the front of the iFlight is more compact. And that can make a difference on the handling, but that's more of an issue for racing and acro than for uh, for the kind of flying that a 7-inch typically does. The other uh, difference between these two designs is that a split deck design sometimes usually, but maybe not always, I don't want to overgeneralize, usually has better resonance characteristics than the way that the GEPRC is doing it, where you have a single bottom plate that goes all the way across to the front and the back. However, neither of these quadcopters had any problem with resonance in terms of mid-throttle oscillation, vibrations in the camera, image stabilization worked correctly. They're fine in that approach, so I wouldn't see that as making a decision between them. I also want to point out that the GEP RC has a little bit of curve in the arms, whereas the iFlight Chimera has completely straight arms. And in general, having an arm that kind of tapers outwards at the bottom is going to give you a little bit better distribution of forces and a little bit better durability than a straight arm, which is easier to manufacture, all else being equal. So between the two, my gut feeling is that the GEP RC is going to be a little bit more durable, but yeah, hopefully shouldn't be crashing these things too much anyway. Hopefully. If you're going to be flying a 7-inch, then you're going to want a GPS unit on the quad, and they both come with GPS units, and they both can have iNav installed on their flight controllers. If you're not familiar with iNav, it is an alternative firmware to Betaflight, which is more focused on autonomous flying, like... GPS waypoint missions, return to home. It can loiter in position, which Betaflight can't do. All of that good stuff. Although you can put iNav on both of these flight controllers, neither of these GPS units comes with a compass on board. I wasn't sure about that, so I just looked, and I can see that there are only four wires coming out of these GPS units, which means they don't have a compass on board. That's a shame, because iNav really wants you to have a compass. Like, I'm not sure it technically requires you to have one, but it definitely wants you to have one, and these would both be improved as long-range devices if they were shipped with a flight controller that had a compass on it. There is an argument to be made that compasses are not that useful when they're so close to, like, these video transmitter antennas, but uh, that would be an argument for someone else to hash out. I'm not going to weigh in on that. Between the two, the GEPRC GPS unit performed much better than the iNav one, at least for me. That's probably not going to be the deal breaker thing that makes you pick one over the other because, frankly, it's not that expensive to buy a really good quality GPS unit and put it in there, but it definitely has to be noted. Between these two, I think I definitely know which one I like better. And I'm going to tell you, but before I tell you, I want you to make up your mind and try not to be swayed too much by my opinion. And if you make up your mind, there are links in the video description below to where you can pick up one of these quadcopters and uh, they are affiliate links. And that means that when you buy anything after clicking that link, I get a little commission. It's a super easy way for you to support the channel before you do your shopping. And let's face it, you do a lot of shopping. You, know, you spend a lot of money on this hobby. Click one of my affiliate links before you do your shopping. It's just a little way of saying, hey, Bardwell sent me. I get a little commission. It does add up and it really means a lot. Okay, between these two, the iFlight Chimera 7 Pro is the one that I look at and go, oh, it's like the GEPRC Moz 7 is the girl walking next to me and the iFlight Chimera 7 Pro is the one I'm looking over my shoulder making the, you know, that meme I'm talking about. Okay, it is super sexy. It flies really good. It's thin. It looks nice. It is really eye catching and it has performance to match. But the GEPRC Moz 7 is the one that I would actually prefer to live with on a day to day basis, because like I said earlier, it, anytime I've had to work on a Chimera or any of the, the modern iFlight quads, they are just so packed in there that they're a pain in the ass to maintain. And this one, although it's a little chunkier, is going to treat me right when the time comes to fix it. But 
don't take my word for it because I have a full review of this quadcopter and it's pretty freaking good too. And before you spend this much money, you should definitely know what your options are. I'm going to put a card on screen with a link to my review of the Chimera 7 Pro and you can check that out as well. I'll see you there.